All right, let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna uh, lecture for about an hour, give you about 10 minutes break, and then we come back with our guest speaker who's gonna start it on. Excellent. Uh, we're gonna continue with life distributions, hopefully to wrap it up this class ahead of your exam in a couple of weeks. And our speaker is gonna speak about design for reliability and uh, later on move on to FMEA, FMECA if you get a chance. Otherwise, I'll go back to it, um, the, the session after the exam. Okay, so about the exam, exam is gonna be in class. Make sure you're here a few minutes early to get your seat. Uh, we are gonna have more students that we can seat in this room. I have another couple of rooms reserved, so don't worry about it. If you wanna come to campus, please make sure to, to arrive in time to make sure that we, we have like um, enough time to seat everyone and start on time. Uh, okay, so because next week is fall break, we are gonna, I'm gonna give you more time for your quiz, in, uh, for your, sorry, for your homework. Instead of it being due on Thursday, right before the class, as usual, because we don't have a class, it's gonna be due on Sunday at midnight. So I'm gonna give you like three or four extra days to work on your homework. And the weather news, no quiz this week. Yeah, so I, I want you to study. Go back and check out everything you've missed because uh, the exam is gonna be very similar in structure to everything we've seen in class and in, in class exercises as well as homework and quiz. Uh, and make sure you can do things in a timely manner. And I understand that your quiz used to be, or, or your quiz is always time, not time restricted, right? But your exam is gonna be time restricted. About two hours, one hour and a half or two hours. I haven't written the questions yet, but one hour and a half, two hours is what you can expect for the exam. And there's gonna be five, six questions. So you need to go through them relatively quickly. If you do everything, and again, there's not gonna be hopefully a lot of surprises. If you have seen, if you have worked through everything that we've, uh, that we've shown you in class, you should be able to be done with it in half an hour, right? Question. Uh, from my understanding, after the due date is passed, you can go and see the, the answers, right? Not, or at least if not the answers, you can see which one you've missed. And then you can reach out to your TAs, you have two office hours. You can reach out to your TAs to make sure that you know what, why you missed that quiz, if you did it. Any other questions about the exam quiz, homework? Open note, open book, bring your laptop with you. No internet, no internet allowed. No messaging, no internet, no cell phone. Right? You can have a calculator or your laptop in front of you. Any other questions? Absolutely, yeah. You have to use R for some of the questions. Practice with R. Anything else? Okay, good. All right. Uh, so hopefully last uh, homework and last quiz weren't too difficult for you because you're going to see questions like those in your exam. So if you missed something, if uh, there was some still something vague or unclear, uh, make sure you go to office hours and seek help. We are gonna review very quickly. I'm gonna go through a, a two or three examples in class again from the, home, a couple of them are drawn from homework or quizzes. So make sure that uh, you have the chance to ask a question again from me, uh, and then we are gonna move on. So, okay, very quickly, exponential distribution. What's a PDF, what's a CDF? PDF. What was that? No? Yes? Shout out if you, okay. For x greater than zero, then capital FX, the CDF is one minus e to the minus lambda x, then reliability is e to the minus lambda x, hazard, Nobody? What's the hazard function? You should be able to calculate it right off the board, right? What's hazard? Lambda, right? And it's constant. Right? CFR. It's the only distribution with constant failure rate. Right? And then it's the only continuous distribution with a memoryless property. I'm not going to go through the details here. Uh, you know expectation, variance, right? Okay. Any questions? Good. 
oh we use uh pxp for get and we're going to go through a couple of examples we are going to go we use pxp if you want to use r right for getting either cdf or reliability dependent on whether we get the we, let, we set lower tail to be equal to true or false we get either either one either one of them right fx or rx okay uh so if you have a complex system right where we have independent failure modes they said that the reliability of the system at time t let's say these failure modes are i um from one through n right then this function the reliability function will be the multiplication of all of these individual reliabilities right i from one through n you know this term right this is multiplication r1 times r2 times r3 times r4 all the way through r right and then we said that oh there's something special about exponential again so if we have ri being exponential lambda i then if we calculate the reliability function we figure out that the reliability function of the system how is that distributed again exponential what is the rate Perfect, sum of lambda x, right? Okay. These are, these are, I'm, I'm assuming that these all look familiar. That's why nobody's responding, okay. But then we took uh, a couple of very quick digressions, right? Where we talked about discrete random variables. So both of these are discrete. These are not life distribution, but we need them because we can use them in conjunction with a lot of continuous random variables and draw further insights, right? Okay, so binomial distribution. It gives the number of successes. There are four criteria for some, some, uh, run, uh, some process to be binomial, right? We have success or failure. Let's start from the beginning. We have n trials. They are independent of each other. Each of them can result in success or failure with a constant priority p, right? With a fixed priority p. And then uh, who remembers the distribution? Priority that x is equal to lowercase x. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, you're talking about exp expectation and variance, right? I gave you that too. I'm, I'm asking about the distribution. And choose x. What is the rest? p to the x. One minus p to the n minus x. Perfect. And then Poisson distribution. It said Poisson distribution goes hand in hand with exponential distribution, right? And gives the number of events up to time t, right? Exponential gives the time between two events, right? That can, it can model the time between two events or the time to failure. Poisson gives the number of events up to time t if the time between failures are, are exponentially distributed, right? So priority that x at time t is equal to n is equal to what? e to the minus, okay, okay, perfect, right? All right, one little thing I forgot. So n here goes from zero all the way to infinity, right? There's no upper bound. One, two, all the way. Here, what's the range of x for binomial? Remember, it gives a number of successes in the n trials, right? How many successes at the minute, at the least, and how many successes at the most? Zero to n. Good so far? Okay. All right, then we moved on to viable distribution. Here I've listed um, PDF, reliability function, hazard function. Uh, we know that this is a positive random variable, right? T greater than equal to zero. And the two parameters are also positive. What, what is the name of, the, of beta? In terms of, you remember we said we have few names for our parameters, shape, scale, location rate beta is shape okay what about eta okay. right okay good 
what is special about um, Weibo in terms of uh, hazard? So hazard for exponential was always constant, right? What about hazard for Weibo? Exactly. So dependent on beta, it can range from so 0 to 1, beta greater than 1. It can be CFR, right? constant failure rate, increasing failure rate, IFR, or decreasing failure rate, DFR. Right? So when is it CFR, constant failure rate? OK, so this is CFR. When is it IFR, increasing failure rate? Here, right, and then EFR. All right. So for Weibull, you also know expectation, variance. For those, you have to use gamma distribution, right? And again, you can call gamma on your uh, on uh, in R, and then you can you can calculate expectation variance. And I give I gave you the formula last class. Uh, what else about Weibull? Oh, okay. So you calculate expect you, you can use the formula, obviously, right, for calculating reliability. Uh, the other option is using py bull, right, with particular parameter values, right. Py bull will give you either reliability or or um, f on reliability, right, capital F. Okay. Quick question. Uh, what is design life if the reliability of 1 over E is desired? Do you remember the special point we talked about last class? No? Okay. So let's look at this. So if I'm, I'm asking you for design life, right? I'm setting this equal to E to the minus 1 is equal to, right? 1 over E to the minus 1 is equal to this. When does that happen? I'm hearing it, right? When t is equal to eta. All right, so it's a special point. Beta becomes irrelevant at that point. Okay. Oh, by the way, there is another name for um, scale. It's called characteristic life. Characteristic life. Just make sure you, you know all terminology related to that. OK. Moving on, then we move on to normal, standard normal. All right, this is normal, normal, mu, and sigma squared, right? And now the second number in the normal um, notation is variance, not a standard deviation. And standard normal is normal zero, one, right? Standard deviation is one, mu is zero. Uh, normal has two parameters again. They are, we know the shape, right? Shape is always bell shape. Symmetric around the mean, right? And uh, it has location and it has scale, the two parameters. Okay, for uh, getting the reliability, like right, you kind of have to, you either have to use a table. I'm not providing the table during exam, so you can um, always like have the table on hand with you. But I, I encourage you to use R, right? And we looked at examples. So P norm. Is going to give you reliability or, C, or CDF, depending on how you set it up. Okay. Uh, what else? We know that uh, normal is always IFR. What else do we know? Um, and oh, we know that this is also referred to as, oh, no, not this, for standard normal, right? CDF. FX, right? For standard normal, let's say Z, we show it with phi of. That value, right? The phi notation is for standard, the, the CDF for standard normal. Right? To so just make sure that we are we are on the same page in terms of notation. All right. Uh, okay, moving on. Log normal, right? The last life distribution we looked at. Uh, here again, we have two parameters, S and P med. Right? Do you remember what they are? S is the shape parameter. 
TMED is the scale parameter, right? Again, a positive random variable, right? Okay. Uh, so we know that uh, if a random variable is log normally distributed, its logarithm is normally distributed, right? If the logarithm of T is distributed with mu and sigma squared, or, or with, with mean mu or, and standard deviation sigma, then we can alternatively use this other function, right, for the, for the PDF, which relies on sigma and mu. And there's a relationship between these two, right? Sigma n is s, and um, t met is equal to e to the mu. Right, so you can alternate. If I give you the pair, for instance, S and U, uh, sorry, S and T med, you can get sigma N and mu N from it, right? Or vice versa. So you should be able to go from one kind of formulation, the two parameters I'm giving you, from one formulation to the other formulation. Uh, what else? Do you know the expectation? You know variance? Uh, you know how to calculate the reliability function, right? Here's the reliability function. I'm using the phi notation. This is standard normal. So you can get the reliability with p norm, right? If you, if you use this value, you do some of the work by hand and you put it in p norm, or you can call p l norm, right? Which is the log normal. But then, then you're, if you're using this, you have to be careful because PL norm gets mu n and sigma n, right? It needs these two. So you ha if you have S and T met, you may need to do a little bit of transformation, right? Not, not a big deal, but you need to do a slight alterations to, to, the, to the prime, right? To make it fit with the, with the notation mu n and sigma n. Good, make sense? Okay, these should refresh your memory. So let's look at a couple of examples. Very quickly, go through this and let me know if you have any questions. I'll go for one run around the class and then uh, we're gonna look at one more. I think we got a good job. I think we got it.
All right, let's look at it. I saw that a lot of you got it, so you're in good shape. Let's see. What did you use for the first one? Yes, that's correct. So let's let's also look at the I'm I'm gonna work through it with R, but that's that's absolutely correct. PY ball, a little bit slower for me. <laughs> Three. Excellent. So let's see why. 200 is the time where I want my reliability. Then I look at this order. Shape, scale. So you can be very specific. Say shape is equal to that, scale is equal to that, to make sure that you are not switched. But if you're sure about the order, you can just go with the shorthand, right? The, the second component is shape, right? So shape is... Three, beta is shape, and 300 is the scale, and then I want reliability, so I have to set lower tail equal to false. There we go. So the next question wants the design life, then you have given the reliability. So someone else. How would you do it in R? Q, yeah. So I'm going to just swap P with Q, and then put that value in there. What do you think we'll get? 200, yeah, right? Because it's the inverse of the other, right? Okay. And then reliability at 200. So I'm going to do the same thing, but then this time beta is 1. Okay, so that's it. But then when beta is 1, what happens? Beta, uh, y will reduces to what? Exponential. So I should be able to also reproduce that with exponential. All right, let's check it out. 200. What's the rate? One over three hundred. One over eta is that rate, right? If it, oh, I forgot that I needed the lower tail. There we go. So this number matches this number, right? Because y bill reduces to exponential there when beta is one, with, and the rate will be one over eta. Again, this is just reinforcing things because I wanted to show you also exponential. You don't have to do it two or three ways. One way is enough. Question. Absolutely. No, no, no. This is like approach one. This is approach two. Approach three is doing it in math, right, with the formula. All of them are acceptable. I just wanted to show you that there are multiple ways to get the right answer with these equations. Good question. So you understand p-bible, right? So you understand also design life, right? How we get the inverse. Q, you can think of q-bible or like q function, of q something, as the inverse of p function. So if you, so look here. So I, I set p at 200. It gives me a corresponding probability, right? Then I put that value in q. It gives me the corresponding point that leads to that probability. So it's the inverse. They, they essentially go hand in hand. One is the inverse of the other one. One gives you the quantile. The other one gives you uh, the, the, the probability. Thank you for the question. Anything else? OK, let's look at the next one. This one is quick. So as you're reading, maybe just also speak up because we look we have looked at this before in class 
Distribution is normal. What are we interested in? Design life. Okay, any take here? 85 is the right answer, so tell me how you got it. Uh-huh, but hold on, I'm typing. Okay, good, Q norm, because you want the re design life, okay. 0 0.95, because that's the in reliability of interest, okay. Uh, 110 for the mean. 15 for standard deviation, and then yes, because you want the desired reliability, right? There we go, 85. So obviously I'm doing it very quickly here. You're gonna have more time, but hopefully the process is clear. Any questions about this one? No? All right, excellent. Okay, one last one. This one is log normal. Let's take a few seconds, think about it, and then we'll work it out. You have it? Oh, no. All right, who wants to take a step? Anybody from the last two rows? You've been quiet. Zero point nine one, go for it, yes. PL norm. Uh, okay, so at at what at what time? Three thousand, okay, perfect. And then we have two parameters. So the first one is mean log. What do you put for that? Log of excellent, 4,500. So we have to take the logarithm, y, because the problem is giving me t med, right? I have to transform it into mu n. Okay, good. And then what else? 0.3 for standard deviation, oops. And then I want reliability, so F, right? So lower tail effect. That is it. Excellent. All right. So hopefully it's all kind of clear. Make sure you go through the homework when we post it, when the solution when we post it. We have both the, um, the math as well as and with the formula, as well as the R, R code corresponding to that. So make sure you go through it and, and hopefully everything will be clear. All right, let's start with, a, with uh, or like kind of new concept, but very familiar at the same time. So probability plots, right? Look at this. What do you think this distribution is? I'm plotting a PDF, right? This could be, I'm gonna take a guess. 
just visual inspection. It looks like normal. It's actually viable with shape five and scale 17. Okay, what about this one? This one is actually normal, uh, mean 15 and uh, standard deviation two. This one, actually this one is also normal, 14 and standard deviation three. It's so difficult to tell, right? Which one is which one? And what is the mean and what is the standard deviation? Getting the parameters by just looking at them. But then think about it. Let's say you do some kind of testing, right? On uh, a piece of equipment or like with a few components. What do you get back? A bunch of numbers, right? What is the distribution for that? Right, so it's gonna be very difficult to do it if we don't look at today's class, if we don't go through today's class. So hopefully by the end of this class, you will be able to fit a distribution very quickly to the data that you observe. Okay, so but then let's, let's think about how, how we may be able to figure out the distribution, uh, what distribution the, the data is coming from. First, let's, let's see what we know about these distributions. So I'm taking here standard normal, right? If I, and, and suppose I have, um, the, the numbers that I'm getting are coming from distribu this distribution. I have almost infinite number of data points, right? Which is not gonna be the case, but let's say I have infinite number of data points. What proportion of these data points Right? Do you expect to fall, let's say this is standard normal, to fall below zero? What proportion of them do you expect to fall below zero? 50%, right? What are you looking at? Phi of zero, right? What proportion do you expect to fall under minus one? Phi of minus one, right? Which is almost 15% if you, if you calculate. What proportion do you, do you expect to see under minus two? This one will be phi of minus two, which is approximately 2%, right? So you can essentially plot them against each other, right? You have, you know in theory, right? What proportion should fall there? And then you have your data, and you can see like what proportion falls there. You can plot the theoretical quantile against the observed quantile. Right? And then you can fit a line and see if that's linear. That supports that the, the, the numbers that you observed are actually coming for, from the normal distribution or like the distribution of interest. So that's the whole concept. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. So the whole concept is plotting expected percentiles against actual sample, sample data. So for normal, to generate normal priority plots, this is the process. You first order the numbers, right, one through n, and then calculate the z scores, and then plot them against the numbers. And then if it's a straight line, then it supports that the numbers are coming from a normal distribution. So let's look at this actually in R. So here I have some data points. Okay. So I'm gonna feed them as X, right? And then you're gonna need the package stats, right? So I'm gonna install it. First, let's see if it's installed. Library stats, oh, it's already installed, so good. So I'm gonna just call that library. If it's not installed, you can install it with install.packages, then you put stats in quotation marks, right? And it will install it for you, all right? So the only thing you need to call to do everything is QQ, QQ norm. There we go. Plots for you. Does it look linear? More or less, right? Okay, linear enough. So if, so you can uh, call the command QQ line after QQ norm to kind of draw a line that goes through the first and third quantile, right? To get that line. And it looks absolutely linear here. Right, so the numbers suggest 
seem to be coming from a normal distribution. Okay. So, but then remember, we also need two parameters, right? Mu and sigma. Right. So let's check. Let's let's look at something. Uh, first, let's generate a bunch of numbers like R norm. Remember, R norm generates normal numbers, right? So I'm going to generate a thousand of them, and I'm going to put them in X. And then uh, let's let's say this is coming from mean zero and standard deviation one, right? Okay. So then I'm going to call QQ norm on this X. So this is how it looks like, right? As expected, they are coming from normal, so they look linear, right? So let's check at at zero, at intercept, right? What is the insert intercept here? Let's add a line. Uh, let's call a b line h is equal to zero, and let's see v is equal to zero. Do you see that at zero, it's zero, right? So it's the same as this mean. Let's check. Let's see if it's actually true. Let's change this to 10 and plot everything again. So I'm going to QQ norm again, right? And then I'm going to draw my lines again. OK, what's my intercept now at 0? What's my intercept at 0? 10, right? So your intercept gives you back mu. Okay. What about the, the slope? So the slope gives you back, let's go back to our original. Let's do this again. QQ norm, h equal to 0, v equal to 0, let's say h equal to 1 v equal to 1. What do you notice about your slope? Slope is 1, which is corresponding to your standard deviation. So in essence, going back here, so you have QQ norm, right? And QQ line is going to give you the corresponding line. And Intercept is what mu is, and slope is gives you back sigma. So you can use the plot to get back the, the two parameters that you're interested in. Yeah, yeah, there is one, but you have to wait until the end of the class. But you're gonna you're gonna get there. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Okay, so is it clear? So we're working our way towards this final command that I'm going to give you. But I want to show you who, how you can visually inspect such plots and get back all of the parameters. Okay, so in general, this is, this is for normal, right? So in general, QQ plots give you back information. You can plot your uh, distribution or your numbers against the distribution, right? To be able to see if uh, you can tease out whether that that the data follows a particular distribution or not. Okay, so now ne next we're going to talk about Weibull, right? We said Weibull analysis uh, is like life data analysis, right? Weibull is very important. So here I'm reminding you of F, lowercase f, the PDF, and the CDF, right? So remember, with all of these plots, I want to plot my expected numbers, the numbers that I'm seeing, right, against the distribution or the, the theoretical values from the distribution and draw a, a straight line, hopefully, right, to make, to show that they, they fall, they follow the same distribution. Okay, so I want to kind of make sure that the relationship between, um, so before, before I go there. So let me ask you this question first. What is the relationship between ln of t and logarithm of logarithm of 1 over 1 minus f of t. Tell me what is that relationship. Hmm? 
This is my F. You may need to do a quick writing, like a few, few, few steps. <laughs> All right, I give you chocolate for that. What's the relationship between ln of t and logarithm of logarithm of one over one minus f of t? What was that? The inverse. No. No. Keep guessing, or or do the work. You can you can essentially do do the math. Figure it out. You want to go for it? No, I, I want I want you to tell me. What's the relationship? No, no, just one word. Just what's the relationship? Linear. Who said linear? There we go. It is linear, right? So your first clue was that we we want. I said we want to kind of plot them against each other and through a linear line, right? To say that they, they, they are coming from that distribution. The other way you could calculate it. So we could say, oh, one minus that will be e to the minus t over eta to the beta. Then the first logarithm is gonna get rid of e. So you're gonna have minus t over eta to the beta, right? And the second logarithm is gonna take care of B, so you're going to have something beta times lambda t, whatever, whatever, right? The rest is going to be constant in t. So they're going to have a linear relationship. It's important because we want to use for just for 10 minutes or something, we want to use the traditional construct that people used to use for uh, figuring, the, figuring out what these parameters are. Now we have like top, top. But I want to know what was in that book. So people used to use priority papers, right? Uh, sorry, as uh, wide papers, right? So these papers are set up in a logarithmic manner. So on the x axis, you plot time, you point out time to play here. On the y axis, you go to the quality percent okay? And then let's try to like, do something. So let's say the first point, the second point, the third point, fourth, and so on, right? You have a bunch of points. And here I'm trying to make it so that it's coming from a wide range, right? And then you do the best fitted line, the line that goes through all the points and minimizes the error. Right? And then this will be your best fitted line. So you get beta by figuring out what, what is rise over run. So this, the slope of this line, is going to give you beta. And then we also need eta, right? What is eta? So you remember this, we looked at last class, then we said all f are going to go to this point for all values of beta. And what is this point? This is eta. And what is this point? This is 1 minus 1 over eta, 1 over e. All right, do you remember this? We looked at it also earlier this class. So this is the first one in the So going back to this paper, so this is the same point, because beta becomes irrelevant at that point, and then, so you see where your line, where the blue line that you fitted, crosses this line, this, this other line, and then you come down and you report this to be your eta. Right? This is the process. Okay, we can, we can look at it in a second again. 
So essentially, the Weibo Priority Class is the paper is set up in a way that you put your, your um, time to failure against the value, the, the median risk value that I'm going to show you in a second. And then rise over run will give you the shape parameter. And where the line, the best fit line crosses 63.2%, gives you a characteristic. Okay, so here's the process. You first order your data points, right? You have n of them. Then you use this approximation to get median median rank, right? For i equal to one, so you're gonna have a table i one two three up to n. You calculate a path of i, right? Using this function, this 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 this, and then you plot them. your failure rank. Your, your failure time goes on the x-axis, and the uh, median rank here goes on the y-axis. Sounds simple enough. Then you try to fit a line. You can do it by hand here. That's OK. You fit a line. You put a line go through, you go through the, the, the point. And then you read rise over run. So here it's almost two, right? And then you see where it crosses this point. Here it's almost what? Look at it, right? It's for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. This will be 80. Almost 80. Right? And this will be your 80. Okay. I'll let you play around with all of these for a little bit. So uh, here I have 10 data points. First, you need to order them. And in a second, just write down the 10 data points. Let me give you the papers. Hopefully, I have enough papers. I think it's good enough. Anyway. Write down the 10 data points because I want to go to the um, other slides where it has a process. So you essentially want to get the parameters. And then, um, Figure out what's the reliability at 100 hours. So we don't have a lot of time. I'll let you work through it um, until, let's say, for eight minutes, until six. Let's see how much you get done. And then we look at it quickly. Because I just want you to be familiar with the process. We're going to do it in R, in, 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 the, in the exam or something. Okay, you wrote down the 10 numbers? All right, so here it is. This is what you want to do.
By the way, a quick note that the paper that you have starts from point one, right? But you can essentially edit it for yourself. So this will be 10 and this will be 100. This will be 100. So that the numbers that you're, you're, you're going to have is going to be around like 100 something, right? A lot of them are relatively large. So I suggest you kind of modify your paper. So make this 10 and this will be 100. So that your numbers are like fall in the middle instead of the corner of the paper. So somebody asked a very good question. So did, how do like you see here you have I and F, right? But in uh, in the question I gave you ten numbers, right? How are all of these related? So the numbers when you order them, the smallest one is eighty-five, right? So eighty-five is index one, right? F one you can't get F one from that formula. Eighty-five and F one are the first pair that you want to plot in your in your paper. Right, the second number. What's the second second number? 135. 135 and F2 go on the paper. Does that make sense?
So anybody got a beta? All right, so these are the numbers that you have to come up with, right? So you need to plot 85 against, uh, so this actually times 100, times 100, times 100, right? So 85, which is almost here, against um, 67, right? So you're going to get a bunch of numbers, I don't know, like somber. Let's say these are your numbers. It's okay. You can. You, uh, I'm not going to ask you to plot them in any time. I just mean want you to be able to calculate them, right? Let's just go through the process very quickly because I want to show you how to do it with R. So you're going to get something like this. If you look at rise over run, you're going to get. So and for rise over run, you don't need to look at these numbers, the x-axis and the y-axis. This is just this is a one-to-one -one paper, right? So just you calculate with your ruler, right? This is like four centimeters. This is one centimeter or whatever. Then the rise is like the rise over run is four. So if you actually do the calculations, you're going to get this to be about 4.3, 4, 4.3-ish. 3, 4, 4 and then when you're doing your scale, so you have to see where it crosses this line, which will actually be 200. So I didn't draw it well, but it's going to be around 200 eta. Okay, so if you have beta, this is 4.3. If you have beta and eta, then you, have, you need to calculate R at 100 with the two parameters. Yeah. It's okay. General idea, it's okay. So, but you, you get the gist, right? Because I'm not going to ask you to do all of these by hand. So this is just before R, right? So you're going to be able to do it by hand, by, by, by uh, software. So this is the only command you, you need for plotting it, right? For generating your, your viable plot, right? But I'm not going to even ask you to do that. I may ask you to plot it just for the sake of like visually inspecting if it follows a straight line or not. Right? And here, if we actually plot it, you're going to see that it follows a straight line. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know. Oh, well. I thought I copied this. Okay, thank you. There we go. So they almost follow a straight line. Okay, but but that's just for visual inspection, right? So you're going to be able to do everything that you wanted. The first question you ask, is there any easier way to get the parameters back, right? With this command, fit distribution. That is from the math library, right? That is, that is it. So let's, let's look at it. Fit. Okay, there we go. 
So you call fit distribution first. You have to make sure that your package is installed, the mass package is installed. Then you have to call that library, right? Then you can call fit distribution your values in quotation, the distribution of interest, right? It will give you back the shape and scale, right? Weibull has shape and scale. It gives you the estimated values and the standard error for the parameter. So we almost got these numbers if we, if we were doing, um, if I had given you time to go through the paper, right? You would have got these numbers or more or less if you had fitted a line correctly and so on. But here you can do it with one single command. Make sense? Okay, so how would you know if your fit is good or not? Right, because you can always fit anything to anything, right? You can fit exponential to normal, get a parameter, right? But how do you know if it's good? So you can use this test, KS test, Kalmogorov Smirnov test, to, to do the comparison. So what you essentially need to do, so here, and you can, you can test it for yourself. Um, so you, you, I'm, I'm uh, generating 200 Weibull numbers with shape 3.1 and scale 12, right? And then I'm fitting a distribution. As expected, these numbers are not going to match, but it, they come very close because I generate essentially random numbers from this distribution, right? So these are my estimated parameters, then my, my standard errors, okay? Then I can conduct a test, right? And see, to see if this, these x's come from Weibull distribution. You have to put a p here. And then with this shape and this scale, then I get a p-value back. So the hypothesis here is that they come from this distribution. So if your p-value is large, you cannot reject that hypothesis. Right? But if you were testing this against maybe shape being 15 instead of 3, you would be rejecting this hypothesis. So that will be the, only, the last thing I'm going to show. All right, so I generated 200 numbers. I'm going to fit a distribution now. I fit it 3.1 and 12. The estimated value were 3.2 and 11.9. Right? So now let's check. Let's run the test. Okay, sorry, my R crashed in the previous window. Okay, here. See, now I, I tested this against 3.11 and 12.33, right? And the p-value is very large. 
so I cannot reject this. Right? But if I was testing it against, let's say, scale of one, see how my p-value is so small? So I'll be rejecting that. Right? So it's not coming from this distribution. Or like with Bible distribution, with these parameters. Right? So it's just a test. All right, with that, I conclude this class. Uh, let's take only seven minutes right, of break and then uh, come back for our speaker because I ran a little bit longer. Uh, we're gonna post homework, right? And you, in the homework, you're, you need to do a little bit of these. And if you have any questions, you can always come see me or uh, the TAs if it's still something unclear. I know I rushed through some of the concepts, but I had to finish it for the, for the exam. Uh, all right, so just be back in a few minutes, in, in like five to seven minutes, and we are going to resume with our speaker. Do you mind if I raise our speaker? I'll be, I'll be with you. Guys, can you still hear me? I lost my mic for a second. Okay, thank you so much. This is a PDF specifically, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay. I tried to give. I know you asked yeah. me. I, I, no, I, I didn't. I didn't put it. Okay. No, I love it. And I switched jobs. I don't even know about anymore. <laughs> but I, I know about. I just I just stick my more like. Yeah. 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 Think it.
Do I put this one in? Uh, can I just yeah, put that I, here? I, I... Hopefully. Maybe. If not, I have to hold it. You know, hopefully that works. Is it on? Okay. So just moving from here, is that right? From the mouse? Okay. <coughs> If there's not one, that's okay too. Yeah. I can use the mouse, that's okay. No, no writing. I don't do math anymore. <laughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> Ready to well, roll? Thank you. How are you guys doing today? All right. Give you a little bit of introduction about myself, and then I have two or three different slides, uh, slide sets, and we'll see how much time we have, and we'll go through them. So, my name is Motaz Al Hadini. Give you just a little bit of background, not much, nothing hopefully boring. I used to work in reliability engineering for 10, 12 years. Now I'm really Six Sigma primarily. I'll talk maybe a little bit about that later. Right now I work for a company called Team Health. Uh, as I mentioned, 12 years experience primarily in quality, reliability, and Six Sigma. Uh, I did teach at Austin Peay State University for a couple of years, quality control, and I did, taught this class a couple of years ago just to fill in as well. Uh, I do have a lot of experience in uh, implementing design for reliability, DFR, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, accelerated life testing, I've done quite a few of those as well, as well as Six Sigma program. Anyone familiar with Six Sigma? Okay, cool. So I was asked to put just a little bit of background. So I started as a quality engineer with Brunswick, basically working on uh, manufacturing, uh, working with suppliers and quality issues, field returns, and so on. After that, I moved to Middle Tennessee, worked for Ingersoll Rand, uh, basically train air conditioning, if everyone's familiar with it, working on the commercial air conditioning. I started as a reliability engineer, six m black belt, and then uh, went up to uh, be a platform leader for quality and reliability as well. And then this is when I started working at the same time for Austin P uh, as an instructor for quality control. They moved back to Knoxville. If anybody familiar with Siemens uh, Medical, uh, really work with them on the PET CT scanners, uh, where you see it in the uh, hospitals for scanning uh, cancer and things like that. So I was working also on developing reliability program across the organization. So teaching just for a little bit here at the University of Tennessee reliability. Moved to a company called MVP as a quality manager, total quality management, uh, working on pumping equipment for the marine industry, manufacturing as well. And then last year, I got an opportunity to work with Team Health, uh, Lean Process Automation, Six Sigma, and so on. You asked what an engineer would do for Team Health. So I'll give you just a little bit of background because I always get asked that question. So Team Health, basically, we hire, we have about 20,000 clinicians, doctors, physicians, and so on, that we hire them, recruit them, we put them into hospitals, do the scheduling, enrollment, and so on. So right now, primarily working on Lean Six Sigma uh, for, for the organization to improve the processes and so on. It's a very uh, good topic. I personally like a lot is really Six Sigma. It can apply in any different industry. Actually, designed for Six Sigma, very close to design for reliability as well. So quick uh, background as well. I got my master's at UT Chattanooga in industrial engineering. Just a couple of additional things. There are more, but just highlights. Uh, American Society for Quality, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. I got a certification as a reliability engineer, as well as Six Sigma from them as well. Highly recommended if you ever go to the field of reliability or even Six Sigma. There are a lot of good opportunities there to get certifications. And uh, ended with a Six Sigma Master Black Belt from uh, Arizona State. So uh, just a little bit of quick background. If anyone has questions, just please interrupt me anytime as well. <clears throat> All right, we'll try to go to FMEA. Anyone heard about FMEA? Tell you more analysis. Anyone has done FMEA? Oh, a couple of people. Awesome. Cool. Uh, also, very dear topic to my heart, FMEA. So, just a, a quick. Uh, tell you more than effects analysis, or some people call it FEMICA, which is an additional criticality. It's another way to measure it as well. Basically the same thing, thinking about failures. So there's been a, and there's a 
I think this has been distributed. Okay, so people has a link anyway. Hopefully that link still works. The last off point of the uh, reliability consulting companies did a survey a few years back asking reliability engineering and companies what is the most uh, important uh, tool they use for reliability. FMEA basically is one of the most important ones based on the feedback they got. Basically, to think about it is continuously improve the design and the process, of course, for manufacturing. But in this case, we'll talk about design, making sure that you do not repeat mistakes in the field and so on and so forth. I have to go through this one a little bit quickly because I have another set of slides as well. But basically, when you start designing, we start thinking about failure modes. I want you to start thinking about not just the design, not only the operation, but every aspect of the product life cycle. How is it going to be assembled? How is it going to be shipped? What kind of stresses you can think about that could cause a failure uh, in the field or before it even reaches the field? When do we do it? Uh, typically, you have a new design or technology, uh, maybe new applications. So you have a component, let's say a compressor or an air motor is used at 100 degrees, but maybe you're going to start using 150 degrees. You need to assess a little bit some of the potential failures that could happen. New parts, suppliers, some field problems, they can use the tool as well for uh, root cause analyses and so on. <clears throat> Who's typically responsible for it? It's basically the design engineer that knows that component of the design should know that inside and out, should own that. But there are a lot of functions, some, some functions, examples that could support that is reliability, service engineer, manufacturing, supply quality. Typically, when I facilitate the Famicas, if I don't have those people, I really don't hold a meeting because you really need to have a cross-functional ideas and thoughts about what could go wrong, how are you going to fix the problem, and so on. a little bit quickly for that because we'll send a little bit of details on it. So I have what I call some critical inputs to the FMEA. We'll talk about it to you later. But also some outputs and then it goes to the process FMEA or Fumica. Basically, this is focusing on how you could fail a design. How could the design fail? But when you move to the process and assembly and manufacturing, this focuses on how you could misassemble or misproduce or mismanufacturing uh, the product that you're looking at. They have to be very... Uh, working together, feedback back and forth, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> one of the most important things is really need to understand the functional requirements for the product that you're working on and that you're designing. Uh, typically, the requirements come from customers. Keep in mind the customer is not only the person buying the product, but also downstream. That's what I'm saying. You need the manufacturing engineer in the room to think about if you design that, can I actually manufacture it? Can I actually service it? And so on, okay? Some examples, cooling system should maintain water temperature X plus or minus something, or mounting bracket should support some structural integrity and so on. So this is the first thing just to think about it as a requirement for the component you're working on. <clears throat> Another thing is lessons learned. Very critical to make sure that you capture the right people, you look at any data that you have, whether it's some field issues, some corrective actions, some previous testing, to make sure that you understand what happened in the past, so you make sure it doesn't happen in the future. So also, also some additional homework up front to make sure that you capture all those issues up front so you do not repeat the same mistakes again. A couple of examples you can go through, but basically you can document it in databases, in A3 format, something like that tables that people have access to so they can basically go to and understand what happened in the past as well. This is a real example. When I used to work for air conditioning, uh, we were looking at variable frequency drive to actually change the speed of a single key motor for energy and efficiency. And we did some teardown analysis for similar products and we found that the VFD sent some signals to the bearings that cause bearing issues and bearing failures. So we definitely use that in FMEA to start thinking about what can we do to mitigate as we design in the future. Please stop me if you have questions or if I'm going a little bit too fast. Change points. So you might have a, a motor, a compressor, a fan, whatever it is that you're using it today, but you're doing some tweaks to it changing something to it. This is probably the biggest risk for you. If you're changing an application, how it's going to be used, how it's going to be mounted, and so on and so forth. It could be the same part, but you're doing some changes to it. Right? So you need to start thinking about those high-risk items. 
uh, again, it could be changing material. A lot of companies go to cost reduction and say, I don't want this expensive material. Can I use a little bit cheaper material? Right? Yeah, you can, as long as it meets the same reliability requirements. Right? So, you, so think about that. Again, maybe a higher load. Maybe you're looking at a new supplier or packaging design changes and so on and so forth. You might think this is not a big deal. Actually, it is a very big deal. How to package the, the product or the system that you're shipping as well. I'm sure somebody got a damaged package in the past before with something. In the So this is just an example of a table. You start thinking about change points, categories, function changes, and start listing what those changes are. Those items will feed in the FMEA, which we'll talk about here. Additional loads, additional temperature, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Next thing is usage profile. So can you design any product without knowing how it's gonna be used? You could, but would it last? I don't know. So a couple of things you need to think about is logistic profile, which is how it's gonna be shipped from a manufacturing to the customer, for example. It go uh, on a train, it goes on a truck, there is shipping, there is vibration, there is shocks, there is temperatures. And the other part is the operating profile. How is it gonna be used? How many times that compressor will turn on and off, right? How long is it gonna be running? Under what kind of temperature, what kind of humidity and so on? So they give you an idea of how many miles, working hours. They give you an idea that definitely these two need to be addressed early in the design, but also could be tested again. So I'll show a couple of examples of testing later. But you need to understand how the system will be used or the product will be used before you even design it. Right? So you, you may be able to design it appropriately. Just a Quick example, uh, kind of dummy example, but based on actual uh, example, you start thinking about the stresses, depending on the uh, profiles, which components, which component affected by what, and start designing based on that. There are ways actually to start measuring. So if you think about temperatures, uh, if you do an outdoor air condition, for example, there are databases out there to know what the temperature profiles look like or humidity. If you're thinking about vibration, you can ship a product in a truck across the United States and measure how much vibration and take that uh, type of stress profile and put it in your test as well. <clears throat> Bandit diagram is simple or could be simple depending how complex your system is, but basically define the boundaries for your FMEA as well. Uh, for, from one perspective, but also shows the interactions between the different components and how uh, they could interact together, what kind of signals go from and to. And a lot of the problems, even in the process and, and the softwares and the system integrations happen actually at the integration interfaces points. So very critical to understand how your system or components uh, interact together and start thinking about what could happen. I'll show you an example on that one as well. Before I go there, basically you can put three or four different relationships. Could be a transfer of material, cooling water, lubricating material, and so on. Energy flow, could be electric heat, and so on. Information flow, signals, and so on. And then physically touching, so thinking about how you mount stuff or things like that as well. Very basic example, when we talk about the variable frequency drive. So basically, we were having a single speed electric motor, and we had regulations for energy efficiency. So you need to lower down the speed of the motor if you don't need it, right? So we're putting a variable frequency drive that will send a signal to the motors to change the speed. It has to be mounted in some new bracket, right? That variable frequency drive gets some kind of energy or electrical from the control box and sends something to the motor. Okay, it has to be mounted somehow, and so on and so forth. When you start thinking about it, you say, okay, how can my VFD fail from here? Well, maybe that signal, maybe you have a, a voltage spike, for example. So you start thinking about how can I prevent that from happening? Also, not only how this could fail, but could this cause a failure here? So the lessons learned we talked about a minute ago, this VFD was sending some currents to the motors that actually cause bearing failures as well. So this is the interfaces where we start thinking, what can I do differently? What do I need to think about? What kind of interactions and so on and so forth. 
this could be simple, could be also a little bit complex, depending on how many components you have, how many actions you have, and so forth. <clears throat> Each component could be a, a cause of failure, could be interacted with something that causes a failure. We start thinking about failure modes at a high level, no function, does not function at all. The fan does not run at all, for example. Partial function, maybe it runs in one or two speeds, not four or five speeds. So you get some partial uh, function out of that. Sometimes it does work, sometimes it doesn't work. Unintended could be a noise, could be Vibration that you did not intend to have, things like that you start thinking about as well. Again, each interface or boundary could be considered or should be considered as a potential cause of failure as well. Next one is P diagram or parameter diagram. It's another tool that you use to start thinking about some additional uh, factors. Uh, it could be System inputs and outputs could be causing a failure. Again, input could be a signal coming in that caused the damage. Or output, like I mentioned that example, you could have an output from a VFD could cause a failure to the motor. Control factors is basically factors that are controlled in the design, maybe material type, material thickness, and so on. How could it be cause of failure? If you don't properly, right? If you choose the wrong material, for example. So this is an item that could control and design, hopefully it is for as well. But the ones that you cannot control in the design are also uh, could be a potential cause of failure. So noise factors, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples here, but system interactions, environment, customer usage, change over time, piece to piece variation. And here's a very simple example. So same system we have, get some kind of signal, some control factors, you start listing those here, right? When you list them, you should be able to control those, but you should be able to know the impact of these control factors on your system, right? What is your ideal output should be, potential failure modes, but really the noise factors are very critical to identify early on. So maybe the torque that you're specifying is not gonna be controlled in the manufacturing. So maybe you need to put some specs on, or maybe you need to work with the manufacturing team on that. Change over time, something changes over time, wear out, corrosion, uh, chemical interactions over time, and so on and so forth. What do you do about those, right? Customer usage, are all the customers driving the same exact miles of the car every year? Probably not, we need to understand that. Are all the customers turn on and off the compressors same amount of time? No, it's not. What does that mean to the population of your uh, products? What kind of environments, temperature, humidity, salty environments, you go to the uh, Florida, we do testing for salt fraud testing and so on. And then system interactions, something working with something else, could be a vibration, could be something like that as well. So a lot of different factors that could definitely affect your product and start thinking about all these homeworks before you do your failure mode analysis. Any questions? Okay. So basically, uh, FMEA or FMEA is really a risk assessment. Help us start thinking about what could go wrong with my design. I'm thinking about design, if I'm here, this one, okay? Uh, focus on customer requirements. And again, the customer is not only the person who buys it, but really somebody downstream in the process as well. And once you start thinking about that, you start ranking the, the risk that you identify. Severity, how bad it is. Occurrence, how often it could happen. Detection is how can you detect that in your testing. And basically, you calculate what we call RPN, risk priority number. I'll show you that one later. But really, it's a multiplication of all these traits. Okay? The higher the number, the worse it is, means the higher priority that you need to work on. All right. So it's a big table. I'll put it in different slides just to break it down a little bit. So first thing is, which system or component that you're working on that should be pretty straightforward? Electric motor, compressor. What is it supposed to be doing, right? Maintaining water temperature, structure integrity, uh, so when it moves some air, if it's a fan and things like that. Then start thinking about the failure modes. Now we start thinking a little bit harder, right? We talked about four different failure modes, no function, uh, partial function, and so on. This is where you start thinking about that. And 
one line item could expand multiple failure modes, by the way. You could have multiple failure modes, and one failure mode could have multiple causes and so on. So, something like that. so that could be a very uh, significant uh, table as you move forward. Okay. Failure modes, basically think about it is how do you observe, perceive, or sense the failure? So, for example, I think I'm going to have a couple of examples here. Motor is noisy. I can hear it's noisy. Well, it shouldn't be noisy. So, uh, cooling system is not really maintaining at 25 degrees. It's really, I'm, I'm really at 35 degrees. My air condition is not running. I see my thermostat goes at 78 to 85. Something is not right. This is how I feel that failure mode. Patient bed that was talking about the PET CT scanners. Patient bed is not moving during the scan. So something is happening. Should be moving, but it's not. This is my failure mode. Right? <clears throat> Failure mechanism, which is uh, not always used in FMEA, uh, needs a little bit of deeper dive there. But uh, examples for uh, for that would be a chemical short, chemical reaction, I'm sorry, electrical short, chemical reaction, thermal degradation, and so on. Sometimes it's not known upfront. Uh, sometimes it is if you've done some root cause analysis or tear down analysis for some of the components. Again, I personally did not use that column a lot, but some companies use it as well. And then what is the effect, right? So if failure X happened, system maybe it's not running at all, or maybe running at a higher temperature or less, uh, uh, less noise, higher noise, something like that, okay? And then you start thinking about the severity. It's one of the three factors we talked about. So how severe is that failure? Basically, companies use different tables, but most of the FMAs I've seen is scale one to 10. One being the least severe or not severe at all, all the way to 10, which is typically safety issues without warning, somebody could get hurt. And then it could be minor, low, moderate, high, and so on. Uh, there are different uh, standards on how to use or how to scale those. But again, one to 10 is very typical for FMA. Now I start thinking about the rest of the table as well. Start thinking about the potential causes of failure, right? If you're doing a design FMEA, start thinking about what can go wrong or what can I do wrong designing that part, right? I specified the wrong dimension. It's too big. It doesn't fit, for example. Or the wrong temperature limits. I chose the material, but it shouldn't really, it doesn't really meet that temperature that I'm, I'm going to use it for. I don't really understand how it's going to be used, how many cycles, and so on. So I think from a design perspective, again, this is, I think about it as one of the most critical columns in FMEA, because based on that, you can start thinking about what kind of need to fix that problem, okay? When you think about design FMEA, try not to include manufacturing related. Somebody will assemble it wrong. Well, let's go ahead and Put it on a, I call it a parking lot for the manufacturing team when they do process FMEA, they can take that one and think about it. Just think about it, just what could go on in the design. Team. All right, current control. What am I doing about it right now? What have I done so far to mitigate that failure? Okay, FEA, FEA, FEA is basically just a modeling. Uh, derating, anyone familiar with derating? Okay, so the rating basically, uh, <clears throat> let's say my application is 100 degrees C. I'm selecting a motor that works that is, its spec is 100 degrees C. So you're not really having much to rating. Can you use it at 120? Probably not. The best thing is you select something that has a much more margin to use it at that, uh, that temperature. <clears throat> then the next Item here is occurrence. What's the probability that failure will happen? And I go again, there's another table which company is different, but uh, again, typically one through 10, very low, almost not, never going to happen. 10, very high, it will happen very often. Some companies choose different ratings or percentages depending on the organization you're working with. Again, the higher the number, the worse it is. Means it's going to happen more often. <clears throat> and then the last one is detection. Based on the mitigation that you've done, can you detect that failure? Can you identify it? And then you calculate the risk priority number. Again, detection has a similar scale as well. 
So if I'm going back to risk priority number, you have three numbers to multiply. So the higher the number, that be the highest would be a thousand, right? The worse it is. That help you prioritize which items, the line items you need to work on. <clears throat> all right. So let's assume now you've done all your uh, early work, you define all the risk numbers and so on, and you have your priorities. Then you start thinking, okay, for the top five, for example, or top 10, or anything above RPN of 200, uh, I need to start thinking about what am I going to do about it. So this is where you start thinking about failure mitigation. Right? So basically, what additional actions uh, you will need to implement, because the original one didn't really work. You still have a high risk. So maybe you need to take an additional step that change material, do additional testing, do the rating, and so on and so forth. Right? Who's responsible for it from a planning perspective? When is it going to happen? And so on. And then start thinking about after you do that action item, after it's completed, hopefully those numbers went down. Right? Hopefully you improve the probability of occurrence. Right? Severity might be the same. If it happens, it's still a, a problem, but hopefully that occurrence went down significantly because you improved the material, right? And you were able to detect it, so the RPN should go down. <clears throat> so basically, an example, and a BFD just carry on. So it should operate at a certain temperature. Failure mode is, it doesn't really operate at X temperature, whatever the X temperature was. And the effect of failure of the failure is the unit does not operate. So I go back and say, okay, what is the severity of unit not operating in my severity table? And it's an eight. It's a big deal. It is big. Right? My cause of failure is I did choose the wrong material for the temperature. Okay. So occurrence is kind of significantly high. Four is big. Uh, then what did I do about it? Did some kind of temperature testing, but my detection is not that great. Right? So I look at my RPN and say, my risk priority number is 160. So I look at that line against all the other lines in FMEA, and let's say this comes on top, so it's a high priority. I'll start thinking about, okay, what am I gonna do about it? Who's doing it and when? And once these are done, capture those notes, and start revisiting those numbers. If it happens, unit's still not operating, so severity is still the same, right, if it happens. But I reduce the probability significantly, and I was able to detect it better. So my number went to 24. So this is how you start thinking about it. Questions? Easy? Okay. If you ever get to do that, do not ever do it alone. Again, it's a cross-functional. It has to have the cross-functional team. You have to have the right people in the room to start thinking from a different perspective. Typically, when design engineers do it, they only look from one perspective which is performance. I'm not meeting the performance. I'm not getting my miles per gallon, for example, or my speed or something like that. You don't necessarily think about, it might meet the miles per gallon, but it's not gonna run long. After six months, it might fail for something that you didn't think about. So always think about that. Always try to bring the right people in the room, okay? Now I'll get to the other one. A little bit more uh, details. It's not FMEA, different topic. which is design for reliability. <clears throat> Anyone heard about DFR, design for reliability? Couple of people, okay. <clears throat> it's my slide so I can share it anyway, but this is from two years ago. Material doesn't change that much. Back then I was working for Ingo RAN, basically air conditioning system. I'm saying that because I'm gonna show a couple of examples probably based on that. Basically it's the commercial system, so something on top of this building, for example, on top of Walmart, not necessarily what you see at your house. It's really big, big, uh, big units out there. So what is design for reliability? So basically I think about it like design for Six Sigma or Six Sigma. It's a roadmap, have different tools in the toolbox. You start thinking about how can I use these tools to uh, capture risks, define opportunities, make sure that I meet reliability requirements, or exceed reliability requirements based on preset criteria. Basically, that's what it is. It's just a roadmap for us to start thinking about what can we do to improve the reliability of a system. It can help us evaluate and, and uh, prioritize risks and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Will the company benefit? Absolutely. So who wanna buy, let's say a TV fails after a year, a year and a half, you spend $1,000 on it? Probably nobody, right? 
So absolutely, when customers start thinking about buying cars or products, a lot of people start looking about uh, reviews and reliability and quality, among other things. Right? I do not want to buy a car that after 30,000 miles will have a major transmission issue. So definitely a customer satisfaction, which means if I'm happy with it, I'm going to recommend it to somebody else. I'm going to buy the same brand again, which means better sales, market share, and so on. Okay. If you do your reliability homework up front right, if you do your reliability prediction right, you can really optimize or improve your warranty period. Some companies now for cars say it's 10,000, I'm sorry, 10 years, 100,000 miles warranty on it, right? It just didn't come out of the hat. I'm sure they did some testing to say, yeah, my transmission will last 200,000, so I'll give you 10, 10, 100,000 miles on it. Right? Otherwise, you might be losing money if you do not know that. If you know, uh, also, uh, companies, if you don't understand the reliability, how would they put some parts in the inventory for service? Right? If you know exactly what your liability is, you can predict how many will fail, and then you can put your right amount of parts in inventory so you're not holding a lot of cash in the inventory. A lot of different things that you can think about, but basically from our organization, it always comes to, to money, right? How much money I can make, how much money I can save. It might sound like it's a lot of money spent up front, but it's really relative to the, the full picture, it's not really. I know I have a, it's not really a full detail, but really I have an example I will show that one as well. So I have four major steps, uh, reliability requirements, application stresses, failure mode analysis, reliability purification. I probably will skip that two and three because we talked about them on the FMEA anyway. Uh, so I'll go first with the reliability requirements. So why is it important? Well, you need to understand what the customer needs are, right? You need to start thinking about what is critical. So some components maybe has uh, a lot lower reliability requirements than that, but you need to start thinking about uh, identification of what is critical, what does the customer need, so at the end of the project, did I meet the customer needs or not, right? Basically, it starts with, I'm not going to go through allocation a lot here, but it starts with my system reliability requirements, so for example, my air condition, and allocate that reliability requirement to the subcomponents and subsystems, and so each, each one of the design team, like so let's say a compressor has a reliability requirement, uh, the motor has a reliability requirement, and so on, but you start with the system one. <clears throat> so can we have different requirements? I think if I'm in an airplane, I would really have a very high requirement for an airplane versus if I'm buying a dishwasher, probably not as high, right? If you think about it that way. And also from application perspective, not just from a product app. So you can use the same exact air condition, same exact one in a hospital, data center, school, and office. And if you ask each one of those customers, they might tell you something different. Why is that? Hospital and data center, I need the air condition or they need the room at a 65 degrees, 24 seven, 365. If you go to school, well maybe it's an eight till four thing, eight till five thing, uh, maybe nights is not as critical, summers were close, it's not as critical, so it's okay. So people have different uh, reliability requirements depending on also on the application. When we were designing the HVACs, 15 to 20 years life is that typical uh, requirement for that. <clears throat> so how do you do reliability requirements? So either VUC, voice of the customer, uh, benchmarking or business class, we'll talk about that next slide. So voice of the customer basically as it is, you listen to your customers and understand what their needs are. It could be proactive, so before the project you have customer interviews, focus groups, surveys and so on and so forth, try to understand what's the perspective, what they need. Or it could be reactive, hopefully you don't have a lot of that because that means you have failures in the field and somebody complaining about it, but it's also some source of information. Customer complaints, field failures, and so on and so forth, okay? You'll be surprised actually, if you're working for a company and try to get some uh, feedback from the blogs of what people actually say, but you can learn a lot too. <clears throat> Next is uh, benchmarking or really internal benchmarking. So basically you're looking within your organization, so Siemens or training or conditioning or something, they have sister organizations as well. You can, hey, you have a motor, what's your liability for your motors look like and what can we do something similar to it as well. So basically it's easier to collect and share data because it's the same organization, but you have limited data of what you can collect. 
external benchmarking or best in class basically you see who is the best in class in designing x that compressor and try to understand what is the liability for that maybe take it and do some testing on it we've done a lot of that get the competitors equipment a lot of companies do that nothing illegal about it but test it tear it down learn from it and so on and so forth you start thinking about what does the liability look like and you need to be better than that if you want to be best in class if that's your goal <clears throat> talked about this i'm gonna skip these two here for a second because we talked about a little bit more details but we also have the slides available okay so let's assume you got your requirements at a system level and a subsystem level and a component level okay you talk to your customers and so on and so forth you understood your application conditions you did your uh, homework understanding the temperatures and all this kind of stuff that we talked about earlier start using those to start thinking about failure modes along with bandy diagrams lessons learned parameter diagrams right so you define some failure modes and issues from there you just done so what are you going to do about that okay so next step basically is reliability verification so basically two things right what are we doing to improve the design and how can we measure or verify that the design is actually improved or meeting the requirements so it's twofold here Again, I, I touched this a lot on FMEA, but basically it is a project plan, if you think about it that way. Define all the stuff that you need to do in your design, whether it's what material you use, what supply to use, what kind of testing you need to do, and so on and so forth. It's very critical. Okay. So one slide about reliability improvement. Basically, if you think about your product or your material that you're looking at and what kind of stresses it will see, you kind of have a couple of distributions, right? One is, what is your material strength? Let's assume it follows a normal distribution, the blue one here. And one is, what is the stress? What is the application conditions it will see? And let's assume also it follows another distribution, okay? What does that overlap represent? Any questions, any answers? That represents that sometimes you'll have the stress higher than the strength of the material. What does that mean? Sorry. It will fail, absolutely. Have a higher stress and so, so this is the basic idea of how to do it better. You need to improve the strength, move that to the right, or reduce the stress, move it to the left. I'm sorry, move this to the right, yeah, move this to the left, and have that gap. Basically, that's what it is. It's not as easy as that, but this is the basic point. Right. The rating. Redundancy is another thing too. You have two components running or one is a backup for another. Like you have a generator at home, for example, you have your power up, generator comes up. Uh, you have multiple engines in a plane. If one fails, the other one will still get the pickup and hopefully will take you safely somewhere. This is redundancy. Uh, of course, it comes at a cost, right? But for uh, some applications like uh, airspace, for example, you need to have some kind of redundancy. You cannot afford to lose uh, the, the plane. Uh, reducing the number of parts in general is good because you're reducing the probabilities, right? reducing the opportunities that will fail. You know, talked a little bit about that. Those more of uh, manufacturing. So error proofing, okay, okay, if anybody familiar with it, basically just error proofing. How can you design it that no one can assemble it wrong? As simple as, Parallel wires, uh, always put the red with the red, blue with the blue, for example. Uh, or you can only put it one way, not the other way. Right? And design for manufacturability. How is that going to improve uh, the design to make it easier for manufacturing, which reduces the manufacturing error? So always think about manufacturing as a customer for the design as well. <clears throat> can anyone think about how you reduce stress? I mean, improved strength is probably pretty straightforward. Make it a little bit thicker, have a different material and so on. How about reducing the stress? Anybody has any thoughts? Give you an example. When we were doing air conditioning, the electric motor that runs the fan could be running a little bit hot. So you can put heat sinks around it to distribute that heat a little bit, dissipate that heat. So this is one way to reduce the stress a little bit on the motor. A little bit more tricky though. <clears throat> all right so let's assume we improve the design talk a little bit about how we're going to verify that or how can we test that a lot of different diff testing techniques this is not even a full list 
the most common one is halt and alt. We'll talk about it here a little bit, but some this thing could be just a teardown analysis to understand uh, how we can improve or how can you uh, verify something. Design of experiments, vibration testing, modeling, material analysis, and so on and so forth. A lot of different ways you can start thinking about verifications. The two famous ones are HALT and ALT. HALT is highly accelerated life testing. Some people call it shake it and bake it test. You'll, you'll know why now, but uh, basically it is two different stresses, temperature and vibration. That's why I shake and bake, right? So basically you get a component. It's used mostly for electronic boards and electrical components, sometimes electromechanical components. Uh, you do not put a compressor in that test, for example. Uh, but basically you get a component, let's say a board, electric board, and you start uh, doing cold step stress. You start room temperature, and you have to monitor the performance of that board during the test. You maintain it for 10 minutes, everything is good. You lower it 10 degrees below zero, everything is good. 20 degrees, 30 degrees, to see where it stops, where it doesn't work anymore. So you start thinking about how far down I can go from a temperature perspective before it stops. Same thing with heat, 100 degrees, 120 degrees, 150 degrees C, and so on and so forth. After that, you do thermal shock. You go from minus 60 to plus 160 within seconds, and go back down. So add some additional uh, stress to the components as well. Then you do some vibration. You start at 5 Gs or 10 Gs, 20, and so on and so forth, till starts, uh, uh, parts start breaking apart. And then you do a combined test. You do the thermal shock and the vibration at the same time. Each one of those typically would produce some type of failure for the most part, okay? Now many companies do it, it's not cheap, but I can tell you from experience, it does uh, find failures that you will definitely see in the field as well. Real life example, we're looking at actuators, uh, different supplier, uh, we're looking at reducing cost. So we define how the exit is life testing as one of the uh, potential testing that we need to do from our plan. And after we've done the testing, we'll find a couple of failures. Capacitor is not probably pretty uh, clear in the picture, but hopefully the slides will all be. Legs were breaking basically because of the vibration. And the screws were coming loose. Okay. You might say, yeah, but you put it under four EDs. Well, guess what? Those failures were found in the current design that we had based on the teardown analysis we have seen in the field. Something gets shipped in a truck, stuff get loose, stuff get broken. It does happen. Okay? So that we found these issues with the new supplier. So we did work with the supplier and said, okay, let's go ahead and fix that. But let's go one step further. You always have to do verification. But maybe it's not fixed. We got some of the new design with the new samples, same exact test, and we didn't have those failures. So I can tell you for a fact, we eliminated the failure modes. I cannot tell you how much reliability improvement happened, but I know it did improve, okay? This is basically a, a picture of the inside of the uh, hull chamber. It's probably typically four by four. It has uh, nitrogen for cooling and heaters and that table actually shakes with vibration and so on and so forth, okay? <clears throat> Next one is just alt, accelerated life testing. Uh, typically used to compare designs, compare suppliers, compare materials, and so on and so forth. And also used to actually, uh, a lot of cases, to quantify or predict the reliability of the product. You can use it qualitatively or quantitatively. So basically, if you do quantitative, you really can get a life prediction if you're able to correlate the stress that you're testing with versus the application stress, temperatures or something like that. Typically, tests at two or three different levels. I'll share an example later as well. The cheaper way of doing alt is just a qualitative. I have a supplier A and I have a supplier B, and I don't really know, or I have a current supplier and a new supplier. I don't really care about how, what is the last prediction. I want to make sure that the new supply is at least as good as the current supplier or cheaper, that's a win-win, right? You don't have to worry about live prediction, you don't have to worry about acceleration factors, uh, you just test them against each other, the same uh, conditions, and you do some wobble analyses, and I'll show you an example of that one as well, okay? This is really fun, by the way, if you guys 
If you guys ever like to break stuff, this is it. So I will still, when I talk to uh, like middle school students or something like that, what do you do for a living? I break stuff, I get paid for. It. Cannot get any better than that. So, so also real, real uh, example here, we were looking at a new supplier. A new supplier was using a new insulation material for the windings. So what we wanted to do is, okay, let's look at the, the thermal degradation of the new material, okay, and how much would it last? So basically what we did is, just for the new supplier to understand that, we have some samples, separate different set of samples, and a different set of samples. And this is your application temperature. So you test it way higher than that. Of course, you have to do some calculations up front. And see how many will last here, and you do some kind of reliability curve in here. How many in here do sim similar stuff, and the same thing here too. This is the touch doing five, five, and five, or I don't remember, maybe six or seven. And based on these three, you can use a model to actually predict your life at the typical condition. Okay, so if you use it at 100 degrees, you test it, let's say I'm just throwing numbers here, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but let's say 200, 250, and 300. And then you can predict actually, why do we do that? Why don't we test it at this temperature? Any guesses? I'm sorry? Exactly, it will take way too long to fail that you might test it for a couple of years and still didn't fail. Hopefully it will last for 20, so that's kind of the plan. If I'm designing an air conditioning uh, system that required to live for 20 years, and hopefully the motor is required to live 20 years, can I this for 20 years? No, I want this for a month or a couple of weeks or six months at the most to predict 20 years. That's why we do this kind of testing, okay? <clears throat> there are ways to, of course, understand how to calculate those temperatures. It's not arbitrarily 500 degrees, right? You can totally see a different thing. We can melt them. This is not the right failure mode, right? We're looking at thermal degradation. So you have to be careful how to test those. Basically, when you do the highly accelerated life testing and you define what is the destructive limit, you cannot test at that. You have to back from that. So this is the first step towards that. <clears throat> Another example is really a comparative testing. It was more of a qualitative B versus C uh, or supplier A versus supplier B, but we managed to figure out a way to actually do a prediction with it as well. So basically we were having field failures. Uh, we didn't know why. We just get motors being replaced in the field all the time. So the first thing we do is, let's bring those motors back and understand why they're failing. We found their corrosion, rust, and so on and so forth. Let's start thinking about a new design and let's test it. So we did like a similar to a rain type of test. And uh, based on the design, the old design had some kind of reliability curve and the new design have a better reliability curve. And because you have that distance, you know that it's actually a better life than this one. So this is just one way to do qualitative. But again, we were able to calculate acceleration factors uh, to really define what's the prediction would look like. This is an example of A versus B. All right, so we're done testing and all those and just talk about different topics here. So typically when you do testing, you're not necessarily reliability, but you do like a performance testing. You expect something to, to not fail, okay? But you have some failures. So we use something like a failure reporting and corrective action system. It could be just a database, could be just a simple uh, Excel sheet, whatever. But basically if you do performance testing and something fails in that performance testing, I have never seen it. It will always, most likely, it will always fail in the field unless you fix it. If it fails in the lab under a very good condition, under these kind of temperatures, once you put it in the field, most likely it will fail. So you really have to get the right people in, start thinking about root cause analysis, what happened, what went wrong, and start thinking about 8D, Six Sigma, and so on. So think about how can we solve that problem. Once you solve it, please link it back to your FMEA, design FMEA, to make sure that you capture your lessons learned in it as well. So let's say we've done the testing, everything is good, we launch the product, is that done? No, it's not. We have post-launch reliability activities and monitoring that we need to make sure that we really meet the reliability requirements. One thing is you test it in the hull chamber, 
or you test it in a lab condition. Other thing is you really put it in the field and see how much wear and tear will actually see. I need to understand that. So we'll talk a little bit about field monitoring, parse return, warranty analysis. Uh, once you collect some information, again, this is a living document. You always have to go back and fill the FMEA, do some design verification, document lessons learned, and so on and so forth. Early launch containment means you, uh, you really monitor the field very closely the first six months, for example, of releasing a product. And if anything happens, you jump on it to contain the problem before you keep shipping more product with the bad problem, okay? So one thing is field monitoring. So basically, this is an actual field monitoring unit. So we contract with Walgreens, I think that's what it was, where we put our units on and say, Walgreens, we'll give you a brand new HVAC, which is our new design. We'll throw away your old one, that 10, 15 year old one. It's brand new, free for you, we insult and everything. All we need is just gonna collect some information from it. How many cycles, what kind of temperature, what fails, what oil viscosities, and so on. We'll take that back to make sure that everything is running according to what we had in the lab, okay? Also, as part of our launch containment, if anything fails, we need to get that one pretty quickly. So we will go into that unit every week, every two weeks, collecting some information from it and go back to the lab to analyze and look at it and so on. Very critical. Actually, a lot of the car manufacturers do that with police cars, taxi cabs, and so on, because they put a lot of miles and stuff and start a lot, so they monitor some of that. How many times a relay is closes and opens? How many times you turn right? How many times you turn left? All that feeds into their reliability program as well. Another thing is parse return. So basically, you have critical components. I'm not gonna say each, every component is critical, but you define the critical few components that you're working with your service team in the field. If that compressor fails, send it to me right away, okay? So I can get it back, analyze it, understand what the problem is, fix it, so the next unit I'm shipping out doesn't have the same problem. If I don't do that fast enough, that means I'm gonna expose because I shipped thousands of units with that bad compressor, okay? <clears throat> and then warranty analysis. You have to always look at your warranty, how many field returns, you do statistical analysis, you do run charts, SPC charts, travel analysis, whatever. You try to compare before the design was released versus after the design was released or before with the old supplier versus a new supplier. You always wanna make sure that you go in the right direction. You do not wanna just go save money by going to a really cheap supplier and lose uh, on the warranty cost, for example, okay? Just with that uh, specific dollar, the 80% is true. There was a big uh, project with train that uh, we did follow the DFR process, uh, spent a lot of time on it up front. But when we did that post launch analysis, we found that 80%, 80% improvement, new versus old design. Very significant. So some people might say, yeah, I don't know, I have time for that test, or I don't know, I have time for enough samples for you, or something like that. There's data everywhere that shows there is really a benefit. There's a return on investment based on all of the process. So just a quick summary, four major steps, right? What the requirements are, what does the customer need, right? Uh, what are the applications to assist? How are your system gonna be used? What kind of failure modes are gonna happen based on those application sources? And verification, what are you gonna do about it? Improve the design and testing. Okay. Very critical to have a reliability program for design uh, groups or design companies. It does really uh, help a lot. And I always include SMEs, subject matter experts. Not just in FMEAs, but in study reporting, in this planning, everything. I never claim I'm an expert because I'm not. I probably facilitate pretty well, but it is as good as the people you include in those discussions. If I put a test plan, it's probably bogus. You need to get the right people in to make sure that you do it right. So. Questions? Anything? Very quiet, quiet. Yes. The screws, I remember, they, I think it was a Loctite or something like that, that they, they changed to. 
the capacitors, to be honest with you, I don't remember. It's been probably eight years. So. Yes, it was. And now, right now, the uh, the newer designs with the smaller capacitors are not having a high lag, so it doesn't break as easy. Other questions? There's a lot of resources online. You go to, uh, let me think for a second. I think Reliasoft is a very good uh, reliability company. They do consulting, they do softwares. And they have a website, I think it's called wobble.com. Um, I think it is. They have a lot of resources in it as well. Uh, American Society for Quality, if you're ever interested in certifications, whether Six Sigma, Lean, uh, Reliability, Quality Engineering, be probably the number one most known. If you ever want to go use one of those, I always think that uh, after you finish school, you're not done. That's my opinion. You always look for a training, for a class certification. So hopefully that will help you out as you move forward. That's it for me. Uh, the testing, it's, I can pretty quickly, it's a few slides, yeah, no, thank you for the reminder. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this was, test was done, uh, basically looking at, uh, life cycle testing with the real life application profile. Thank you for the reminder, I forgot about that one. Uh, we talked about that one, so basically, problem statement, we're looking at PET CT scanners, and, uh, basically the, Patient handling system is really the bed that goes in and out into that donut, okay? Uh, we define some opportunities there. There's a cable in there that will rotate back and forth. So we're primarily worried about fatigue of bending over time, multiple times, okay? So we start thinking about what can we do about that one? How can we test it? How can we do predictions? And do we need to take any corrective actions, okay? <clears throat> So basically, we got four cables. Each cable has multiple wires. Four is a small sample size, by the way, but because it had, I think it had like eight wires in each, so we have a, a decent sample size. We uh, our homegrown this picture. You don't have to have the most best looking this picture. If it does the job, that's great. So basically, we had to make sure that uh, it mimics the actual application, the bend radius, for example, how the brackets are designed. It's exactly the same thing, okay? And then start thinking about what is a test cycle. So a test cycle is basically it goes back and forth twice. This is what the test cycle is. And start thinking about that. And again, the failure we're looking at is just basically the, uh, the bending or the fatigue of the cables over time. Basically, that's the, the primary failure mode we're looking at. And we were able to monitor, because you need to monitor the cycles to failure, right? So we're able to monitor continuity with a PLC during the whole test. So we know exactly at what cycle it failed, if it failed. Another way to do that is just you check it every so often. So you say it failed be between cycle 100,000 and 101,000. You can still do analysis with that. But the exact time to fire is always better, okay? <clears throat> so basically, we started with four cables, as I said. The red ones, that's the ones that failed, right? And after number two failed, it failed a little bit prematurely. I think it was 100,000 or something like that, 172,000. We replaced it with cable number five, but it survived. So we suspended the test at a certain time, and we said, okay, we had four failures, one survived. The one that survived has that number of cycles, so we have time to suspension or uh, censor. And then we had time of failures that we can actually use for, for analysis as well. He talks a little bit about the types of failure modes and if specific wire fails, what could happen. So we had two extra wires. If it fails, it's not a big deal. A couple of them, it will stop the system, and one of them is used for service. To so just give you a little bit of idea and background about the severity of the failures. Definitely, if one of those fail, this is a big deal. If this one, who, won't care, who cares, right? So you need to start thinking about that. Okay. After we've done the testing, we looked at the data, we calculated some parameters. We used, for this case, we used Wibble Plus Plus, a software that we used. Uh, we did a two parameter Wibble distribution. Beta value was 3.7, which means wear out. Okay, it's even here. Ah, I didn't answer. So, what is beta below one? What does that mean? I heard something. I'm sorry? 
Yes, decreasing fire amount. Typically infant mortality, typically manufacturing defects, typically. Higher than one, two, three, and so on is increasing failure mode, is wear out, typically it's a design failure. Just give you a little bit of perspective on that one. So when it's 3.7, that's a design failure. Means it's really a wearing out. It's the end of its life, really, okay? So it's not like somebody assembled it wrong. It's really, that's kind of the life expectancy of it. We calculated L10, we calculated mean time to failure as well. So you can do a lot of analysis with, with, the, uh, with the data that we have. And then start thinking about stress. Remember the distribution for strength versus stress? So we said, okay, we have the strength of the material based on testing, right? We have that distribution. And then we'll start thinking about the stress, how we calculate that. Basically, the bed goes in and out, in and out for one patient, okay? So you need to understand how many in a lifetime, let's say in 10 years, would that go in and out, which means how many bending cycles will happen. So a couple of ways we looked at it, and I'll show you, we chose one specific one. One is we looked at the how many PET scans and how many CT scans, the two different types of scans in the same machine. And we start thinking about, okay, how many cycles, and we chose a 95th percentile. Way too conservative. So it didn't make sense for us. We tried to do something different. We got the actual number of cycles, from the data that we collect from our field systems, and we actually were able to fit a distribution. So now we have a stress distribution and a strength distribution as well from the testing. And we're able to, uh, this is the stress distribution, we're able to do like a, three different ones, one for 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years, okay? Then we're able to do exactly what I was talking about a little bit ago, right? We have the material strength from the testing that we've done, and we have the stress from the data that we have from the field. And we're able to calculate what does overlap represent? Probability of failure, right? 10, 15, and 20 years. We came up with some reliability numbers, and interesting enough, it was actually meeting the reliability requirement. We didn't need to take any additional actions. It is well beyond the reliability requirements we identified earlier. It's not every time something fails, you have to go fix it, by the way. Okay? If it's meeting your requirements that you decided up, up front, that's great. Right? If it's not, then you have to think about it. So based on that, calculations, models, again, the application stress and the strength of the material, we said we're good for 20 years. So pretty high reliability numbers for 20 years, actually. So thank you for the money. That's good. Questions on that? Again, this is the fun part. That's my opinion. I was, you know, I yes. Yeah. What do we come with the requirements for? It? Yes. I've seen a lot of different companies do different things. That typically, it comes back to how much, right? So, for example, some companies would say, I'm willing to accept on this scanner to spend X amount of money over 10 years. And you start thinking, okay, that amount of money is, what does that mean as warranty failure? They start backtracking from that. And so I think, okay, if I'm willing to spend $100 per year, how many failures equals $100 per year? between labor, material, service, and so on. So I think, okay, that means that the failure should be X, and then that will be your liability fund. Some companies do think about it that way. Some companies say, all those big systems, air conditioning, uh, pit scanners, cars, dishwashers, this is what we call repairable systems. So you have 20 years, don't expect it will never have a failure for 20 years. It will have failures, right? It's called repairable systems for a reason. But if, for example, you see a compressor, if you, this is your product, compressor is probably not repairable. You have to throw it away. So you have to think about it that way. Okay? It would be nice to have a car that never breaks for 500,000 miles, but it's not going to happen. It will be very expensive that nobody will be able to buy it. Right? So you always have to think about from a return on investment that it costs me more to improve that. I mean, I can do it 
R30, R40, whatever it is, but it'd be way too expensive that it doesn't make sense. Then. So you have to think about it from a business perspective. Good question. Other questions? Anybody? Hopefully, we'll do some testing. For those who don't, done FMEAs, are you guys working somewhere, or we just did it as part of a class, or mix? Okay. Very important tool. So, very time consuming too. So, uh, design for reliability, my opinion, maybe because I've done it um, a while for, for, for some time, I really enjoy it a lot. Uh, typically, you don't have a big team of reliability engineers and companies, typically smaller teams. My advice is, as I said earlier, uh, always study a little bit more. There are a lot of free resources out there. I'll tell you that uh, ASQ certification, which needs some certain level of experience too uh, in the field, very recognizable by companies, whether it's Six Sigma or CRE and so on. Not an easy test, but it's a really good test. Uh, use the resources available out there to start studying and, and so on. So a lot of the Six Sigma also applies, so that will also help a little bit too. But again, it's always try to be on top, just learn new software like Bible Plus Plus, or ManyTab, or GMP, or whatever you're using in the class. That always helps you. So, always good to put it on the resume. Yep. Uh, for those who did not graduate yet, or even the people who are graduating, I always suggest that, and I don't know if everybody or almost everybody is seniors or not, internships, co ops, very critical. I've seen a lot of companies that uh, hire from within that program. So you can go intern for, I always tell people that, maybe some people agree, some people don't agree. I always tell people, you can take a summer and even have a break from school for one semester and you two will say, okay, and go ahead and do some internships and learn. I've seen people that got hired before they even graduated because of that. I got somebody who was interning with my team for six, seven months, and he had one more semester, and he was going back to school, and the manager said, you know what, do it this part-time till May, and in May you have a full-time job. So it, it exists, and a lot of companies do that, and you get paid. Most of the companies, that, all the companies that work with pay for the interns. So it's better than working something else, you're working in your field. The other thing is, you learn the communication with the team, you meet with, I, I have people working with VPs and C-level, and managers and directors and learning from that. We typically give them actual projects to work on. We have interns that we actually uh, made them get uh, Six Sigma Green Belt certifications. Before they even graduate, they have a Green Belt certification with two, three projects on their belt when they go look for a job. Even if they're not working for that company, it's very good for your resume that you have certifications, you have experience. The other thing is you might go work for a group and let's say you do reliability engineering, but you're working with R&D and say, you know what? actually like R&D better. Now you're learning something new that you might actually work in a different group as well. Building relationships, people will give you recommendations and so on. So I think internships or training in general, very critical. Other questions, comments? All right, cool, thank you.